Irene, for organizing such an incredible conference. I've really enjoyed it. Great content. And it's a real privilege to uh, share the podium with uh, fellow Irishmen like the great and powerful Conor Curley and honorary Irishmen uh, like, like Tom and Shandeep there. Although I don't think Tom was that enamored of the honorary Irishman title until just after the Six Nations. And then he's like suddenly embraced it. He's all out on St. Patrick's Day, green shirt, the whole lot, you know. Um, so I'm Dr. Alan Desmond, I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and I'm from Ireland, like a lot of the speakers today for some reason. Um, but I work at Torbay and South Devon NHS Foundation Trust and you can find me at devongutclinic.com. So when I qualified as a doctor in 2001, I didn't really know what specialty I wanted to work in. But contrary to what a lot of plant-based doctors say or feel. I think as doctors we get quite a good grounding in clinical nutrition in medical school. We certainly learn about organic chemistry, I did a year of organic chemistry, then we learn about the basic building blocks of nutrition, then we learn about what serious deficiency states can cause and why those need to be prevented. And sure we don't learn about the advanced application of these techniques, but I didn't learn how to do colonoscopy either in medical school, but now I do thousands of colonoscopies very well. And so I think we undersell it a little bit. And who is better placed to look at the research and apply it to clinical scenarios other than the people who are seeing people and treating people with lifestyle diseases all the time? So when I hear plant-based doctors saying, well, I, didn't know, I don't know anything about nutrition, but listen to me, because I'm an expert. It, it seems contradictory. So, so please start, stop apologizing for your uh, undergraduate training. So what is Crohn's disease? Well, Crohn's disease is a type of inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. And patients with Crohn's disease get damaging inflammation affecting parts of their bowel. Now, we commonly see these patches of inflammation in segments throughout the large bowel or colon. And we'll often see it in the uh, terminal ileum, which is the last part of the small bowel. Those are the two major patterns of disease. But these patches of inflammation can affect any part of the, tr the whole GI tract, actually, e everywhere from your mouth right down to your bottom. And we see a lot of patients getting problems around the bottom end with inflammation and infections. And as the disease goes on, not only do you get inflammation, but on the right-hand side there, you can see a bit of bowel that's becoming damaged and narrowed and strictured and developing blockages. And even worse than that, the inflammation then goes outside the GI tract, goes into the adjacent tissues. So you get these pockets of infection and infl inflammation deep inside your abdomen, which can be extremely difficult to treat. So most patients are diagnosed with Crohn's disease between the age of 20 and 40. And unfortunately, most patients with Crohn's disease do not spontaneously enter remission. Um, only 10% of our patients are in sustained and deep remission. 90% of our patients are not. Right, look down here, actually. Um, about 50% of, in 50% of cases, the medications and treatments that we use do not prevent them having to have surgery, and about half of our patients with Crohn's disease will end up having diseased segments of their bowel removed. And the patients who end up having diseased segments removed, 50% of them will need another diseased segment removed 10 years later. So there's a lot of improvements that we could make in how we treat inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the graph you're looking at there is shown at every gastro conference that you go to. Any gastroenterologists here? Fantastic. And any other health professionals involved in treating inflammatory bowel disease here? Fantastic. Um, so this diagram shows us on the bottom, we've got the inflammatory activity flaring up every now and then. But what's going on in the background is this chronic damage which gets worse and worse and worse eventually leading to surgery. And this diagram is used at meetings to encourage us to prescribe more and more and more medication and to aim for perfect control because we want to prevent these long-term uh, complications. Now, Crohn's disease, as you can imagine, has a significant impact on the people diagnosed with Crohn's disease. There's a high rate of absenteeism from work with all the economic costs to that. There's a high rate of school absenteeism in kids with Crohn's disease. And most people with Crohn's disease do not describe themselves as being in good health. However, the drug treatments, which I prescribe all the time, have come a long, long way in the last 20 years. And patients with Crohn's disease can live perfectly normal lives. There is uh, Carrie Johnson there, who was diagnosed with Crohn's in 2003, and went into went on to compete twice in the Olympics as a rower. When I graduated from medical school, the teaching was that Crohn's disease was like a classic autoimmune disease. So what was going on here was that people with Crohn's disease got really unlucky in the genetic lottery. 
They had abnormal genes, and because they had abnormal genes, their immune system was going wrong and attacking their gut and trying to destroy their gut. What we, and, and then there's the, we knew as well that there was some sort of environmental trigger because e even then we knew that not everyone with the genes got the disease. We're like, oh, there must be something in the environment that's causing this disease. What we now know, and this, this isn't controversial, is that the genetic story doesn't really explain Crohn's disease. So we've got these genes like NOD2 and MHC that are more common in patients with Crohn's disease, but not everyone with Crohn's disease has these abnormal genes. Um, if you have these abnormal genes, it doesn't really tell you much about what sort of inflammatory bowel disease you're going to have, and it doesn't tell you anything about the prognosis. We were right on the immune system. The immune system is going wrong, but it's not attacking the gut. It's attacking the bacteria and the gut contents within the bowel, and the damage to your gut is a bystander. It's collateral damage. And yes, I'm going to convince you today, environmental factors are key. So the understanding of Crohn's disease is somehow genetics load the gun. I'm not totally convinced on that. Diet pulls the trigger, and then the immune system causes the damage, you know, like a lot of these autoimmune diseases. But what's been happening for the last 30 years or so is diet, we've been pulling the diet trigger harder and harder and harder, and the natural history and prevalence of this disease is changing dramatically. So just to understand a little bit about Crohn's disease and the mechanisms of the disease, so on the left-hand side here, you've got a healthy gut lining. Your gut lining is about 400 meters squared. A lot of it is only one cell thick, and its job is to interact with your gut contents, absorb nutrients, defend against invading organisms, and even to take little samples of the environment so that your body will recognize it later if those things get into your system so you can have an immune response. Uh, the gut is covered with a little thin layer of mucus, which helps to protect and has other important functions. And that's your healthy gut lining on the left. On the right-hand side, we've got the gut lining of a patient with Crohn's disease. The mucus layer is depleted. The junctions that hold the cells together are open. You've got stuff coming through. You've got bacteria and toxins coming through. And you've even got some bacteria which are being transported through by the cells and presented to the immune system. And then your immune system starts reacting to these things, and inflammation happens, damage happens, and you've got a damaged gut. This is from The Lancet last year, sounding an alarm bell. Crohn's disease used to be a rare thing. This was a rare diagnosis. When it was first described in 1932, it was a very rare diagnosis. Then throughout the 20th century, it exploded in industrialized countries alongside the changes in our dietary habits. In the 21st century, those figures have kind of plateaued in North America and Europe, but the prevalence of Crohn's disease now is incredible. You look at Germany, one in 310 people with Crohn's disease. It's about one in 450 or one in 500 here in the UK. So this isn't genetics. Our genetics haven't mutated as a, as a race in 50 years. And if we look at countries that have been newly industrialized since the 1990s, these countries are showing more and more cases of Crohn's disease, and most of these patients, lots of these patients, don't have a genetically loaded gun. Now, we spoke earlier about what causes Crohn's disease, and we're talking about genetic, genetics, immune system, environmental triggers. There's some truth there. But all of our treatments really focus on modifying the immune response. We, we can't do anything about someone's genetics, whether or not they're contributory, really, not yet anyway. But we don't really focus on the environmental triggers. We tell our patients to stop smoking, just like uh, lung cancer. There's never been a randomized controlled trial, but we know it's bad for Crohn's disease, so we tell them to stop smoking. But we don't really do a whole lot with diet. And we use medications and surgeries. And the medications that we use are immune suppressants. I'm not going to go through them all here now, but they have side effects. Some of them are pretty nasty side effects and they cost a lot of money. Um, so the drug treatments are very good, I prescribe them all the time, but they come with side effects and they're costly. Now, our little hospital spends over a million pounds a year on these drugs, and globally it's big business. So there's a 2022, there's a global market of over four billion dollars in these drugs, there's a lot of money here. Now, when I meet patients who've just been diagnosed with Crohn's disease, I tell them all about the endoscopy, the scans, the inflammation, the treatments, and they all say, is there anything I can do with diet? And they don't mean, is there foods I should exclude to make me feel better? They say, are there drugs I can exclude to alter the course of my disease? That, that, that slide I showed earlier. And we need to have evidence-based answers, because if we don't give evidence-based answers, our patients are onto the internet. And when you ask Dr. Google, 
we know the problem, right? There's too much information out there. So we need to act as filters and help our patients make good decisions. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a brief tour of the evidence-based stuff that I tell my patients. So fiber. Anyone here who treats patients with inflammatory bowel disease know about the low fiber diet. Lots and lots of patients are on the low fiber diet. But we know that fiber actually protects from Crohn's disease. We've heard the uh, Harvard Nurses study mentioned. So the ladies in that study who had a, uh, the highest fiber intake, which was still only 28 grams a day, but they had a 40% reduction in developing Crohn's disease. We also know from this second study here from the University of Montreal, when they compared the diets of young people who'd just been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease versus those who hadn't been just diagnosed with Crohn's disease, they estimated that a high intake of fiber reduced your risk of Crohn's disease by 88%. And they saw less notable reductions for veg, fruits, fish, and omega-3 fatty acids. And so we have an observation there. Okay, fiber, Crohn's disease, or something there. But more than an observation, we have you know, plausible biological mechanisms that have been studied that explain why. We know that soluble fiber reduce, reduces inflammation in the gut, metabolizes into short-chain fatty acids by the bacteria in your gut, which a colon need to maintain health and to not become inflamed. We know that fiber actually helps to maintain the integrity of the epithelial barrier to help stop these things getting in and causing an immune response. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And Shireen, you already mentioned indole 3-carbonyl, a phytonutrient, which is found in cruciferous veg vegetables. And this also reduces gut inflammation in models of Crohn's disease. So if we take some patients with Crohn's disease and they're on the traditional low-fiber diet, and we tell them, well, you know, fiber is actually really good for you. Why don't you have some fiber? Um, what happens? Well, here in 2013, we've got 11 patients with active Crohn's disease who are on the standard low fiber diet. This, this study wasn't sponsored by Kellogg's, but they gave them all three grams of insoluble and nine grams of soluble fiber once or twice a day, which was a bowl of all bran. And all 11 felt better. Their symptoms diminished, and they reported overall improved well being. Yet, a low-fiber diet is standard advice for patients with Crohn's disease. And if we go back looking for the evidence base, was there randomized controlled trials of low-fiber diet and Crohn's disease? Well, not since the 1980s. And when you look at them, they showed no impact on disease prognosis. In, in fact, in the second study on the right-hand side there, the patients on a low-fiber diet did worse. So here's a landmark study from 2010 um, from GUT. So here's a little bit, another bit of the explanation. Why is fiber so good? Well, one of the problems that we see in Crohn's disease, one of the hallmarks that we don't see in other inflammatory bowel diseases or healthy people, is that there's these little cells in the lining of your gut called M cells, microfold cells. And their job is to constantly sample what's going on in your gut. They take little samples of food and microorganisms or whatever else. They bring it in. They present it to your immune system. It's transported safely to your lymphocytes, or to your lymph nodes where then your lymph nodes generate um, immune globulins, so that if this stuff ever gets into your system, it recognizes it and your immune system can respond. Um, but in patients with Crohn's disease, there's this E. coli bug that's really good, for some reason, E. coli bacteria is really good at sticking to these M cells, getting itself transported in and generating an immune response. It's pathological, it's not normal. Well, in this study, they've taken some uh, human M cells, sorry, pointer isn't working, uh, human M cells, and they've exposed them to soluble plant fiber. And they were able to reduce this translocation of E. coli by 70%. So fiber reduced this, demonstrably. In the same study, they took um, an emulsifier, polysorbate 80, which is in a lot of foods, vegan and otherwise, and they exposed the same M cells to polysorbate and noticed a significant increase, a doubling, I think, of the translocation of these bacteria. And in fact, the authors wrote to the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis and said, it's the emulsifiers. It's the emulsifiers that are causing Crohn's disease. But I think the emulsifiers could certainly be contributing, but it's not just the emulsifiers. And here's another study looking at the same phenomenon. These um, green, this green splodge here is a layer of human M cells. And the red stuff on top is E. coli adhering to those M cells. That's what we see in Crohn's disease patient cells. And these are Crohn's disease patient cells. And when they expose those cells to maltodextrin, a ubiquitous flavor enhancer, they found they could really increase the adherence of the E. coli. And the authors said, our findings demonstrate that maltodextrin enhances bacterial adhesion and suggests a mechanism by which consumption of this dietary additive may pr pr uh, promote disease. 
Animal fat and protein, yes, it's linked to the incidence of Crohn's disease. Japan is one of those countries that's seen a huge increase in Crohn's disease over the last few decades. And when they studied it, they found that animal protein and all the other stuff you see up there is associated with that increase. And the author said increased dietary intake of animal protein and N6 omega-3, or sorry, N6 omegas uh, with less N3 may contribute to the development of Crohn's disease. And similar data from France, another prospective study where they take thousands of healthy people and follow them for ages. And they found out that in the patients who developed inflammatory bowel disease, those patients were the same people who were more likely to have a high intake of protein, particularly, well, they glued meat and fish together in that study. And if you're in the top one third for meat consumption, your odds of developing inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease were tripled. And another study getting a bit repetitive now, but here we have children versus diagnosed with uh, inflammatory bowel disease versus healthy children. High intakes of animal protein, omega-6 lipids, iron, are likely to be involved in the pathogenesis, pathogenesis of pediatric IBD. So let's move away from that. Let's talk about dairy. So there's the most evidence for dairy. Um, so a high fat and high milk fat diet can induce or exacerbate Crohn's disease or colitis type disease states by multiple mechanisms. All the stuff I talked about earlier, the reduced bacterial layer, the increased permeability, the increase of uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is pro-inflammatory cytokine, um, invasion of those harmful E. coli, unfavorable changes in the microbiome, they've all been demonstrated in the laboratory to be induced by dairy consumption. And we also know from the Japanese data earlier and other data from other countries that the more fat, animal fat, and milk protein a country is consuming, you can just watch the Crohn's disease going up alongside it. And then another reason that I feel pretty comfortable telling my patients with Crohn's disease to go dairy-free is lactose intolerance. So this is a phenomenon where you just don't diagnose uh, lactose very well. It does a lot of bloating and diarrhea. It's quite common in patients with Crohn's disease. And in fact, in countries like the UK, where lactose intolerance is only present in about 10% of people anyway, patients with Crohn's disease are much more likely to be lactose intolerant. So it's a win-win-win for patients with Crohn's disease to go dairy-free. So this all begs the question, has anyone published data on treating Crohn's disease with a diet that excludes these harmful foods? Well, the no-food approach is very well proven to work in Crohn's disease, and it's been used for decades. So we had mentioned there earlier from Andy about these artificial feeding products. So in patients with Crohn's disease, particularly children, um, switching them over to a diet where they're only allowed to take these artificial, artificial food-like products is shown to be very effective in treating uh, Crohn's disease. This is stuff originally developed by NASA, contains the basing, it was for astronauts initially, um, the basic building blocks of food, which are easily absorbed, simple sugars, amino acids, peptides, vegetable oils, vitamins and minerals. And if you put patients on this, yes, they do get better. It works in children. It works in grown-ups, we've recently found as well. So it certainly works. Now, for decades, people have been studying all these different formulations, saying, what is it in this entropy that's making them better? What we know now, it's not what's in that stuff. It's what's not in that stuff. That's why the patients are getting better. Now, these two big studies, I was very excited when these studies came out because these are studies taking patients with Crohn's disease, and we already know if we stop them eating all of the foods that they can get better. Well, that's really hard for people. People hate that. You know, here, you can just have this kind of gooey stuff. This is all you're allowed to eat, especially for a kid. So the question is, can we let them get some of the calories from this gooey, horrid stuff that nobody likes to take, and about 25% of people refuse to take anyway, and can we give them some normal food? Can we give them whole food, including all of the restrictions I mentioned earlier, take all those harmful foods out? So this um, is from Ari Levine, from his group in Beth Israel, or sorry, from his group in Israel. And they looked at two groups of patients over three years. They've got the patients who've just been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And then they came back a few years later and they looked at the patients that are really difficult, the heart sink patients for us. The patients have had Crohn's disease for a number of years and they've been on all the therapies. They're on immune suppressants, they're on infliximab, they're on these anti TNFs, these expensive drugs with all the side effects, and they're still getting worse. Particularly these patients who've already had some surgery. Oh, we don't want them to lose any more bowel because if you just keep chopping bowel away, eventually the bowel stops working and patients get dependent on these artificial feeding products into the veins permanently. So these are really interesting studies. So what these studies tell us is that yes, we can treat out of Crohn's disease successfully with a diet that restricts animal protein, animal fat, N6 PUFAs, dairy, emulsifiers, and food additives while containing dietary fiber. So they took um, a total of 68 patients, 47 newly diagnosed, 
21 with the difficult to treat disease in the second study. And they, uh, they were all in a severe or moderate flare of their disease. They all needed to be pushed back into remission. And they allowed them to take 50% of the calories from the artificial goo stuff that we talked about earlier, but they were allowed to take 50% of the calories from whole foods that excluded all those things that we talked about earlier or severely limited them. And interestingly, there's quite a few patients in the studies who said, I'm not drinking that stuff, but I'll do the diet, I'll, I'll eat the food, but I'm not drinking that other stuff. And they reported on the outcomes in those patients too. So these figures for a gastroenterologist, are great, right? Because here are the newly diagnosed patients. On the left-hand side, their serum CRP, which is a measure of how much inflammation has gone in their body. You can see at the start of six weeks, these patients had a high CRP. At the end of six weeks, their CRP came crashing down. The second diagram shows their Crohn's disease activity index, which is just a measure of how poorly you feel and how sick you are with Crohn's disease. And they were all in the moderate or severe range on the left. After six weeks, you see the disease activity coming right down. And all they've done here is changed what these people are eating. They haven't given them any new medications. So 78.7% .7 of people showing clinical response at week six, and 70% plus in complete clinical remission. Which for someone who treats Crohn's disease all the time, these numbers are astounding. You know, these, this, this is better than the drugs in many cases. And of the patients who went into complete uh, remission, I think about 85% of them were still in remission six weeks later. Here's the data for the difficult to treat patients, the patients with that difficult to treat disease. Um, similarly, on the left-hand side, you see the, uh, the markers of inflammation coming down, their disease activity coming down, their CRP coming down. On the right-hand side, you see the clinical measure of how sick they were, the Harvey Bradshaw Index. As you can see on the left, all of the patients were above that dotted blue line, which means their disease is active. And as you can see, lots of the patients came down below the blue line, and the people with very active disease started coming close to the blue line. So after six weeks, 90.4% of the patients were feeling a lot better, and 62% were in complete clinical remission. Now, 62% sounds disappointing, but for these patients who've been on immune suppressants, they're on anti-TNFs, these patients are very difficult to treat. And even the new anti-TNF, the second and the third line drugs, will struggle to beat these figures. Um, Ari Levine, Professor Ari Levine, um, also includes in the, second in the second study reporting, look, we've got 18 patients who we've treated with a whole food only diet without the uh, artificial stuff, and 77% of them are in remission. And when you speak to him, he says, yeah, we're treating more patients, and we're doing more studies, and um, watch this space. So he wasn't the first person to publish these sort of data. When we're treating Crohn's disease, we first of all try to get people into remission and then we try to maintain that remission so that it remain well. Here's a study on maintaining remission. These were all patients who had just been treated for a flare of their Crohn's disease. Typically, you'd expect these people to get better on medicine and then flare again a little while later. So what we do now is we get them better at medication and then we keep them on medication. But in, when this study was done back in 2010, they had these patients who had all been made better, predominantly using medication, some of them with surgery, and they followed them for several years. They asked them either to go on a semi-vegetarian diet or to continue their omnivorous diet. And with the semi-vegetarian diet, the patients tended very much so to stay in remission. And the numbers that they showed about patients staying in remission were, were really startling. Um, but even the author, uh, Dr. Chiba, uh, when he wrote to the Permanente Journal and said, evidence level of our study is not enough to make gastroenterologists appreciate the efficacy of a plant-based diet in IBD. Clinical studies providing high level of evidence showing the efficacy of plant-based diet in IBD is eagerly awaited. I think the studies I showed you a moment ago provided some of that evidence. And right now at my hospital, we're working on getting ethical approval and funding for doing a similar study and contributing to the body of evidence. So when I see my patients with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's disease now, this is the evidence-based advice that I give to them. And there's nothing controversial on here. This isn't a million miles from the uh, Public Health England Eat Well Plate. And when the Eat Well Plate was published in 2016, there was a great article published alongside it where did this huge uh, academic work say, well, if everybody ate like the plant, the, uh, the, Eat well, the Eat Well Guide, which is predominantly plant-based, really, when you get into it, there'd be... 17,000 fewer cases of colorectal cancer in the UK every year. There'd be 4,000 fewer cases of stomach cancer in the UK every year. Now, as part of my job, I diagnose people with colon cancer all the time at colonoscopy, and then I meet them at clinic, and I say, I'm sorry, 
you've got colon cancer, I'm sorry, you've got gastric cancer. And those are devastating diagnoses. Colorectal cancer, I think it's got like a 50% five-year mortality or thereabouts. Um, stomach cancer has a horrendous five-year mortality. Most of the patients who are diagnosed with stomach cancer die within a few years due to that diagnosis. So when I tell my patients with Crohn's disease to eat like this, I know I'm doing them a big favor. And we could simplify that slide by showing this slide, which you've seen already. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Thanks very much.